Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool video for you this evening. We have been working on this Bally Medusa pinball for what seems like eternity. This thing is super complex. It just has a lot of stuff going on. It's one of the most collect, uh, complex of the early Bally solid state games that I've ever seen. So we've been running into all kinds of things. Not really problems, just stuff that needs to be addressed. So uh, we have done several videos on this already. I think this is the sixth video on this game. That's right, six videos. Uh, so we're going to, in this video, work on it a little more, see what else we can get done. Now in the previous videos we did uh, work on the lamps, we did work on the uh, MPU, we cleaned the play field, we did some cosmetic stuff, we worked on the back glass, we've done all kinds of stuff. Uh, but we're now getting up to the point where we need to get the thing to play. So we're going to focus on some more of trying to get it uh, a little bit further down the road. So one of the things that I've that's been bugging me are these drop targets up here. Now if you look, they're sitting too high. And then also two of them, uh, the game is not able to drop themselves. So basically the game has a little coil in here where it can just simply knock the target down. But those two for what for whatever reason it can't. Now you see when I just pushed it, they went down a little lower. It's still a little high though, so I'm going to see if I can adjust that. Let me pop up the play field and we'll look at the bottom while I answer the phone. I gotta say, and you people know I don't complain much, but I gotta say, this thing has one of the worst setups I've ever seen for the play field. <laughs> it's a tall play field, there's extra stuff going on, but in order to lean it back, you have to pick the play field up, take it off of those hooks, and then mount it on two other hooks. And the only way to do it is to pick it straight up in the air. The thing weighs about 80 pounds. It's not simple, folks. If it was right here and it was a suitcase and it had a handle and I needed to move it from there to there, I would have no problem. You could even scooch it a little bit with your foot. Wouldn't be that big of a deal. But this is some, well, I'm just saying maybe they should have redesigned it. This ain't the greatest idea. Okay, but we got it up there. All right, so if you look closely... Here are the coils I was talking about. Look at that. It's crazy, they've even all got three lugs. Why would that be? Why would They must have reused a, uh, a coil they were using for something else. That is just nuts. They're like flipper coils. They have two windings on each, but one of those windings isn't used. See, the, the wire isn't connected. So two of those don't appear to be working. And then also when they fall, they don't fall all the way. And then even when they do fall all the way, they're a little bit too high. So the, the way, whenever they reset, this pulls in and pushes them up out of the play field. And then gravity pulls this down. But if you look, it can get kind of hung, right? So gravity needs to be able to make this go all the way down here but it kind of catches. We messed with this a little bit on the previous video, but apparently we didn't get it quite right. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the uh, plunger loose and see if, we've had problems where there's rust on some things. See if there's rust on the plunger that's making it uh, act up or if it's more of a physical thing up here. This is just a, a bar that goes from one end to the other. Okay, and there's two coils that pull it up but whenever it comes down, it kind of catches. This side seems a little better, but um, but we need to get it where, once it's laying back down, that gravity alone can pull that back down. This guy keeps calling on the phone. He's high, and he's asking me if we have a certain game in. And then he's hanging up and calling back and asking me the same thing again. Come on, people. You got to put the joint down. It ain't helping you. Come on now. Come on, people. All right. So this thing, uh, the catch isn't in here. It's right here. There's this little pivot. Um, and the, it looks like the C-clip is bent a little bit, so it's, it's binding a little bit. So I've got it loosened up. And I think that's right. I think we're good. Okay, and then the drop target's being too high, 
strangely enough, I've been noticing this the whole time we're working on it. This somebody has put tape on it. Old school masking tape. Several rotations of it. Is that that same guy? <laughs> so this tape is about the thickness of how high up the drop targets are sticking above the playfield once they drop because they fall right on top of that. So um, I'm going to take that off, put it back to normal. I'm not sure why they put that on there, but it's making the drop targets where they stick up just a little bit above the playfield when they're all the way down. And we don't want that, people. Come on now. That ain't right. Don't don't modify it, people. No mods. No mods mods. Okay, so let me take that off, and then we'll see if they sit a little better. And then we'll see what's going on with those two that can't drop. That was my brother, Donnie. He doesn't do that stuff. But he don't touch that crap, people. Come on now. That wasn't him. Come on. That wasn't him. Okay, here's the tape we took off. You can see where the drop targets have been landing on it. Now, why did they do that? I don't know. Why didn't I take it off before? Because it may have been to fix something. I don't know. You know, it might have been a good idea at some point. So, uh, we have now determined that it screws us up a little bit. It makes the drop targets a little bit too high, sticking out of the play field. Now, remember, I changed the drop targets. Maybe the old ones were a little shorter or something. I don't know. Something's going on. But we have now determined that it ain't helping us that we know of, so we took it off. Okay? So now, whenever they fall, I've got them all down. They are pretty level with the play field. There's a little bit of a lip, but there's a hole there anyway, you know, so I mean there's going to be something. It's not going to be perfect, but it's pretty good. Okay, so now we got to figure out why, um, and this is still moving really good. So now we got to figure out why one of, the, or two of them won't drop. I've looked and I don't see any wires that are disconnected, and I looked at that too whenever I, uh, had it open. So I'm going to get a multimeter. I'm going to turn this thing off and I'm going to check the, the resistance on the coils and just see if there's any difference in the coils or if those two just happen to be uh, where they're uh, there's no the resistance doesn't check the same or something like that. So let me mess with that and uh, see what we find out. Okay folks so we're looking in the manual They use this solenoid expander relay. Now, why would they do that? It's because they didn't have enough solenoids on the original board. This is one of the later Bally's before they switched over to their 6803 system. Uh, so they needed more. This, this game is loaded. It's got stuff all over it. Tons of drop targets. Seven, I think there's 11 drop targets. Just looking at it from over here. Um, zipper flippers, four pop bumpers, uh, at least three kickers that I see, uh, a pop-up or a save thing between the flippers, a saucer. There's crap everywhere. Loaded. Okay, so they didn't have enough solenoids to make everything work. So they used this expander relay. So what does it do? It allows them to use one line, which I assume, <laughs> you know what that means, is they're using one transistor on the solenoid driver board to drive two solenoids depending on where the expander relay is, which is a pretty co interesting little way of doing it. By using the uh, solenoid board to turn on this relay, you can just swap all of the lines to the other, uh, to all the other relays, so you can double the number of relay, uh, double the number of solenoids you can put on a board by doing that. And then they could probably put another one on there and make it where they had four times as many, just to get cutesy with it. But if you look at what we were had, it if you count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the top, it appears that the two that are not dropping are the number four and the number five top drop targets which appear to be ran by the same transistor. So it says A3, J2, pin 12. So this is the solenoid expander board, and brilliantly, they changed it back and forth by not even using a uh, coil driver, so they didn't have to do that. They used a lamp driver. 
So they just use a lamp driver to uh, use an optocoupler to turn the coil on, uh, which switches the the uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, which solenoids you're addressing. So let me show you something. I'm going to show you the old uh, Bally Supersonic schematics, which was one of their very first uh, solid state games, which would have been probably five, six, well. It would have been about four years before this one. About four years before this one, when they had just started using this system, let me show you how their solenoid schematics looked. So this is one of the early games. And so down here, you have the voltage regulator for the um, high voltage for the displays. Here you have the voltage regulator for the five volts for all of the boards. And then up here is part of your... Um, the driver board that basically enables and uh, disables the flippers. So basically, when the game's not on, they turn the flippers off. And this area here, these outputs are not used. Okay, and these are inputs to it. So over here is where their solenoid select lines come in. Right. So this is just coming from the MPU, and it goes to this one of 16 decoder or is that a one of 12 I can't hardly read it I would think it's one of 16 right you got four lines uh, so uh, I guess we could count them 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 there's at least 15 <laughs> okay and here are the outputs so you can see on this one connector they don't even use any of the outputs the knocker is connected to one line okay and then in these other two connectors, only one of the outputs is used for the out hole. And then down here, they use most of them, the saucer, the left bumper, the right bumper, the bottom bumper, the left slingshot, the right slingshot, and drop target reset. Okay. This same exact board is used in Medusa, but four years had passed and the games had gotten much more complex. So instead of all this stuff being empty and the way this is used, they've completely changed everything. So here is the same schematic of the exact same board. There's nothing different about it. They're, they're completely interchangeable. It's just they use it differently. So down here you have the display voltage regulator. It's the same. You have the 5 volt voltage regulator. It's the same. And then over here you have the stuff that does the that enables the flippers. It's all pretty much the same. They use it. They're doing it a little bit different. But uh, and the coin lockouts over here, but I think that was on the other one as well. So this is all still the same, but over here, everything's different. So yeah, one of 16 decoder. So it's the same chip, same exact board, everything's wired the same uh, on the board. Everything's laid out exactly the same, completely interchangeable. But now, because you have that solenoid expander that they run with the lights, you end up with this top connector being completely used. So, one of the lines goes to the number seven drop target reset or the number one top drop target. Uh, one of the lines goes to the number two top, top, top drop target or the number three. One of the lines goes to the number six top drop target or the number seven, which is on the right end. Okay, so those are used. You still have this one that says in you, not used, but if you follow down, you'll see that it also connects to this one down here, which is the bottom right kick slingshot. So yeah, it's not used, but it's used by one of the other connections. Uh, this line is the number four or the number five top, top drop target, right? That's the one that's screwed up on ours. So this is what we're looking for. Q7 may be problematic. Our Q7 might be acting up, people. Or it could just be the, the connection on that wire is messed up somewhere. But both of the ones that aren't working right all go back to Q7 through this wire. Okay, and then here you still have two, a, a two, two lines uh, on J3 that are not used, but it's because that's doubled up. So like that one is actually used up here for one of them. And that one uh, is the one that we looked at down there. It's the right slingshot. So then you have this connector that wasn't used at all, these three lines that wasn't used at all on the other one, that's doing the shield or the gods post, the number four drop target reset or the close uh, movable flipper, the zipper flippers, and the knocker or the open the zipper flippers. 
the out hole or the saucer, the bottom left thumper bumper, the bottom right thumper bumper, the top left thumper bumper, the top right thumper bumper. Now, why would they do those like that? It's because they need those to act immediately, so they don't really want to screw around with having to switch the bottom left thumper bumper on whenever the ball hits the bottom left thumper bumper. What, like, what if they have it on the wrong, the solenoid uh, is in the wrong direction? You know what I mean? So they, they want to be able to have that act instantly because uh, you get a lot of stuff going around there. And then the, they do the same with the left slingshot and the bottom, uh, let me see, bottom right slingshot and the top right slingshot. So the slingshots and the thumper bumpers, they want to act really quick. So they didn't double those up. So no matter which position the solenoid uh, expander switch is in, those will work instantly. The other ones though, like so it lands in an out hole, it wants to think about it for a second. It can switch that if it wants to make the coil fire. Um, so it slows those down. But this is pretty cool to see. It's basically them reaching their final form. The great engineers at Bally knew that they would need all of these freaking transistors here for all these solenoids. But uh, they didn't know what form that would take. And eventually they got there to the point that they're actually having to double stuff up to use it. But they made it work. Now on some of the games like uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pac-Man, there's actually two lamp boards, I think. Is that right? They started putting an extra lamp board in there, but then they, on some of the games they have two complete lamp boards in the game. Uh, Rapid Fire was like that, the, the uh, shooting game. So they, they were able to add as many lamps as they wanted, apparently, if they just added extra boards. Okay, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at that line and see if I can tell if it's connected from the two coils all the way up into the back box to this pin. That could just be our problem that the wire is not connected. Okay, folks, we have the playfield slid out. Well, it's in the same rack that it was, but I've carefully laid it down. It's sitting on stuff it shouldn't be sitting on, but I've carefully done it. They didn't do that right. That ain't right, people. Um, so what I've done is I have just le uh, looped into the tab of Q7, which is the uh, one that drives this particular coil. That tab is connected to the center leg, which is connected in with the board to the post, which is connected to the wire that goes all the way down through here. So we're doing that to check to see if that tab is connected to that wire that we need to get to. So, it's kind of hard to see, but I've taken the connector apart and show enough. If you connect to that line, it's a dead short. Now, I like doing like a continuity test just to see. I lost my light. Just to see um, what that's looking like. And it's like 0.5. My leads have like 0.2 resistance in them. There's 0.4, so I mean it's pretty much the dead short, which it should be. So that tells you that that uh, um, transistor is connected down to that wire. Now I'm going to show you another way to do it. We're going to get cutesy with it. Because now my problem is it could be the decoder chip. So basically the signals come in here. And then it tells the decoder chip, the decoder chip sends a signal to one of these three chips and they, they sync the transistors. So we could have a problem with one of these chips or we could have a problem with our decoder. It's, it could be the decoder, but it's, well, I'm not going to say it because I'll jinx myself. You know what? I'm not superstitious. The, uh, it could be the decoder, but not usually. Usually it's one of these little sub chips if that's the problem. So how are we going to do that? Since that's connected to the coil, and since this board grounds those, what you can do is just ground the, the tab of any of those and you will turn that solenoid on. The other side of the solenoid always has the 43 volts that it wants, and so it's just a simple way of making it happen. Now, it, it may not happen on this one. Well, one of them will drop, no matter where that solenoid expander is. Uh, if all of this is over your head, you haven't followed it, go back and watch it it's a little more complex than they usually are. But basically, we're going to use a jumper wire to ground these tabs, which will make the solenoids work. Now, why would we do that? Because it tells us that the wiring from here to there 
is completely fine and it tells us that the coil is fine. We think the wiring is fine, um, but this is a good way to confirm that the wiring is fine. Okay, so this is not going to tell you if the transistors are fine. We checked those though with the multimeter and they all seem to be fine. But it will tell you if the wiring is fine. So number four, for instance, is the shield of the gods post up there. So I'm going to ground the number four transistor. Okay. So I'm just connecting that to ground, which is what these chips do. We're just short circuiting all this to see if our problem's here or from here out, right? So that's number four. Number five, I believe may be one of the drop targets. That's the reset, okay? That'll be useful. Number six, okay, that dropped one of them. And number seven, here's our problem child. Ooh, it worked. Okay, so that tells us our thing. So the coil is fine, the wiring is fine, it's either the transistor or it's something up here. It can't really be these lines because if these lines were messed up, you'd lose like, you know, a fourth of your coils. Uh, so it's something on this board. So how are we going to figure that out? Well, we can probably figure it out with a multimeter. So we're in test, and in test, uh, they don't pulse the, the targets very long, so they don't have enough strength to actually raise back up. But you can see each one of them twitching. Basically in test, it just pulses them real quick, so it doesn't hold it long enough for it to actually reset everything. Um, but I couldn't find anything wrong with the board, so I replaced the tip 102 that drives those two and it fixed it. It tested fine, but whatever. Okay, so I think we've got that. Now I'm just checking the other ones to see if everything works. So I believe every single coil is firing. So I think I think our coils are good to go. Um, these ones over here don't have memory drop targets. It just has a reset. So it, it can't remember where these were and drop individual ones. Okay, so uh, I think that's going to fix that. For whatever reason, when the game starts, it looks like it leaves those two up. Anyway, I'm going through the test. It looks like it leaves those two up at the beginning of the thing. That may have been our whole problem. Watch this weird little thing that it does. So there, there's something going on with it, but it's like a physical thing. I haven't figured it out yet. But we're going to have to play it a little bit and just see uh, see how that goes. The flippers the, seem to be moving and doing their thing. The, the coil up there can do its thing. I think we tested all of the switches before, and we got those all working. All of the lights. So we've I, I think we've fixed that. We had a problem here where this light all the way at the end wasn't working, but it was because the holder had fallen out again. It's kind of a weird setup here, but I got it in pretty good now. And there's one here that whenever you're playing the game, it only lights every once in a while. But that appears to be just how the attract works. So, um, yeah. We're kind of ready to resolder the displays. And I need to reprint these pieces back here. Look how bad all of those look. I need to reprint all of those. Um, and then we still have the soundboard stuff to do. 
Okay, so what you got to do to the displays and the uh, soundboard, but one thing I wanted to uh, point out, there is a weird little thing happening with these lights. I looked at someone else's video just to make sure it wasn't supposed to do that, and it's not. But it's it's like a, uh, it's a perfectly screwed up thing. So if you look, there's all these lights, and there's bulb number one, two, three, four, five, six. Bulb number seven, look, it's bad, right? Except it's not. It pulses like one, two, three. It's like every third time that the other ones do. Weird as hell. Why would it? Why would it be perfectly messed up like that? I mean, that's crazy. So when you're playing it, that bulb will light up, but it, it, it's like that. Sometimes it's off. Sometimes it. Maybe it's every fifth time or something. So I don't know. So I gotta figure out what's going on with that bulb. I think that's on the auxiliary lamp board, which we haven't messed with yet. So I think what I'm gonna do is probably end up uh, replacing the SCR that runs that bulb. So let's look in the schematics and figure it out. So it's the seventh bulb. Okay, so in the schematic there is this uh, diagram of the auxiliary lamp driver board, which was used in several games. Um, but basically, it has one connector where you have some lines coming in. But they're calling PD3, PD2, PD1, and PD0. And then some uh, address lines and a strobe line. Okay, It goes to a MC141758, I think. And then it has three little control lines that come out. So the three control lines, basically, I guess, are the address lines going to each of these chips. 14028. 140208. We'll look at it for real here in a minute, okay? Uh, so these are going to be some kind of decoders, obviously. All right. And those are what sync the SCRs turn on the lamps. And so there are four of those chips. Four data lines controlling them, I guess. Three address lines going to each chip. And then uh, a bunch of SCRs. And so it, it, the whole thing's just strange. They're calling it the top of panel, but that seems to be the lights that we're talking about. It has this diagram over here. You want to see the most useless diagram ever made? Explain this to me. Looking at the back side of the insert, the top is up here. There's nothing on it, right? Now, the insert is the thing that holds the uh, displays and all of the lamps and stuff. They drew a diagram of the back of the insert, and there's nothing on the diagram. <laughs> it tells you which side's the top. I can tell which side's the top. It's the up top. It's the part that's up. Come on, people. Why the hell would they... People, come on. Come on now. Why are they getting me start? If you draw... People. Why would they do that? You, you, you're drawing a diagram. You don't... If they would have put a little, come on now, why, why would they do this to me? They drew a diagram with nothing on it. Why? Would... What the hell is this for? It just says top. What? What's the deal? Come on now. Okay, so it says top of panel, top of panel. So I thought that there must be lights all over the back glass that light up. Nope, it's that bar thing that we're looking at. So number seven, I guess is the one that we got a problem with. I got a problem with the whole thing. It don't make any sense. Why would they do that? So, number one, left top of panel. Okay, so number one must be all the way over. Okay, so if you look, it's got a whole bunch of them. There's number 18, so it's got to be that thing. That's the only thing with that many lights on it. And here is number seven. It's J3, pin three, 
which is Q16. So it could be the decoder chip, but I'm hoping that it's just the SCR um, is a little weak or something. Kind of weird, though, that every fifth time it lights up. You know what I'm saying? Kind of sounds like that'd be something a decoder chip would do, doesn't it? It's like the code is not being decoded. Something going on. It's like the strobe ain't strobing. But every five times. This thing might be doing some math. And the math is messed up. That's all I'm saying. It seems weird that it's perfectly screwed up. Alright, so we're going we're gonna to pull the board out and check it out. See what we can find them. See what we can find out on it. Come on, let's go. So here's the board. Here's the connector where they come in. They talk to U1. U1 then talks to the four decoders. Part numbers are. Are you ready? Get your pencils. That's a B, isn't it? MC14175. I got them. I don't need it though. So just my thinking this is how i think now i might shoot myself in the foot here. if the signals come here and here and they, they pass through that and then only three lines go to these chips to control them from this chip this chip can't be the problem right because if it had a problem on one of those three lines it would mess up all four decoder chips so we'd have at least probably a dozen different or you know several different uh, chips not working right. I mean, uh, light's not working right. So it's probably not that chip. It could be the one decoder, or it could be the the uh, actual SCR, or it could be like bad solder or something like that. But the way that it's perfectly doing it, uh, I don't know, a little weird to me. Okay, so Q16 is the bad one. Or maybe not the bad one, we don't know yet. Q16, boy, it looks good, don't it? I don't see nothing wrong with it. I'd say that one's a good one. They've all got a little rust on them. What do y'all think about this vintage tech? Isn't this cool stuff? Look how Bally just showing their butt. They got to go with the futuristic text on it. Look at them. Look at them, Bally. I see what you're doing, Bally. Valley Manufacturing Corporation. Very cool. And this is the part number of the auxiliary lamp board. This version was made the 24th week of 1981. Probably when the, the silk screen was drawn up, not when it was actually printed. Lamp driver. See, it says copyright 1980, so the silk screen on the front's a little newer. The design of this. Okay. okay, so as typical, look, we dropped off our our label. As typical, all these ballet boards suffer from bad solder joints. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We're gonna find a good one on this one. I've already spied it with my little eye. Okay, well let us go closer. Or should I press my luck? Oh, we're starting to get blurry. There we go. Look at that first pin. You see the little square around it? That's a physical cold solder joint, they call it. Basically, it's broken. So because of the way that the, the connectors flex the, uh, the end pin, it has broken it loose from the board. So it will work intermittently if it just happens to be touching the solder that it's broken loose from at the time. Uh, it will work. If it's... Uh, not touching good enough to conduct electricity it will not work but that's a ground and it looks like they're redundant so I don't know so that one may not be too big of a deal now all these ones in the middle usually are decent because whenever you pull off the connector you kinda of pull it to one end or the other and then you see as you get towards the end they start getting worse so see that one at the very end looks pretty bad too it's physically broken away from the board so all of that needs some new solder added to it to reflow it. Okay, and then if we go around to this other side here, look at this. We'll we zoom, zoom, zoom in it. Look at that one. But if you look close, that doesn't go to anything. So there's no trace. 
Now let me look at the other side of it real quick. Yeah, there's no traces on the top. Okay. Let's see if it'll go back to focusing how nice it like it was. All right. It kind of did. There we go. Yeah, so see that one? Yeah, I'm going to resolder it, but it's not really important because it's not actually connected to a wire. There's nothing connected to that trace. And so I would say the first three pins there are kind of screwed up. Even this one here, that I'd say that's, that's pin four, but that's the third pin that's actually installed on the board. It don't look that great, you know, but you can see it looks a hell of a lot better than pin one. Okay, and then you go along. And it looks, see it? So you know you're getting towards the end just because the pins are getting worse. Wham! Look at that one. What in the world? So you see the, the two on the left actually are connected to traces. Those are connected to, to lights somewhere, and they are not going to be heavy. Okay. And then over here, look at this one. It's completely dropped out of the freaking hole. It ain't even touching. But again, there's no trace going to that one. So it's nothing. Now look at this. There's pin three, baby. Pin three. Wham, bam, there it is. Pin three looks absolutely horrendous. That's why it's only it's only blinking every once in a while. It's all it can muster to build up enough little power to, to get through the wire or something. I don't know. It's something like that. Look, I'm not a technical person, people. But obviously that's going to be part of our problem at least. We, we might, you know, depending on how, uh, you know, amperage works and heat works and stuff, it may have fried the SCR just because it was like the little engine that could or couldn't. You know what I mean? Well, so what if the SCR keeps trying to pump through voltage through that damn uh, connection to, to make the line, the light come on and it just can't and somehow it's uh, after every like five blinks it actually has enough to where it barely blinks the bulb I don't know how that would work but maybe let's say in our little world that's what's going on it may be straining that that SCR maybe it burn it the hell up I don't know but we're, I'm gonna try just reflowing it first and see if that fixes it but you see how bad they get Now look, we don't know where the end is, but look, it's already starting to get worse. Oh, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Yep. Okay, so the way I do it is, I take a, uh, a wire brush, and I hit them a little bit with the wire brush. You can go pretty aggressive, and it don't mess anything up. I just... Now why am I doing that? Because I want to get all the dirt and stuff off of there so that the solder will flow really well and then I just add a little bit more solder to each one and let it basically build up a nice little pool or mountain of solder up on the sides of the pin and that's that. Now a lot of people will remove the old solder um, well what they'll do is they'll add a little solder because you have to you can't really remove that solder without a little new solder on it They'll add the solder, and then they'll remove it, and then they'll add new solder. Big waste of time, in my opinion, but you do you. So I just add a little, get it where it's making good contact again, and that's that, okay? Um, so I think that might be the problem, because that connection is god-awful. And it's, uh, Q16 is right there. Yeah, it is the one. So that very well could be it. So I'll just re I'll, I'll clean it, resolder them, and then we'll try popping it back in and seeing if that alone fixes it. Okay, folks, that did not fix the light. So it's not the solder, and I replaced the tip 106 or whatever it was. It is not that either, so it must be that logic chip. So I had to order some. So when I get those in, I will put it in and see what happens. I don't know if I showed you, but I got the light back there to work that was not working. It was just socket needed cleaned. And are you ready for this? Look at that. All new instruction cards. Now you might say, how in the world did you do that? 
Did I scan them all? And nah, I didn't have to do that. Somebody else had already done it. So there is a guy online at uh, pinballrebel.com. He has a he hosts Incognito's pinball instruction card scans, and some kind soul had recreated all of these instruction cards. So I took them out one by one, and then put new ones in one by one, and that really. That really changed the whole story. The, the thing didn't really look that great um, with those old ones in there, but it looks a lot better now, much more presentable. So one other thing I'm gonna have to do, I've replaced these bottom two connectors here because the original board had a lot of battery damage. So alkaline had spread all over the bottom of the board and had messed up those connectors a little bit. But we're having this trouble, this problem where sometimes the ball lands in the out hole and then will not, uh, the game doesn't know it. And if you mess with it, mess with it, mess with it, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, ever find it. Okay. We, we, so we've been trying to figure out why that is. So we have tracked it down to this connector. If I wiggle this top connector, which is also the switches. So that's one switch connector. That's another switch connector. One does the, the uh, rows and one does the columns or the... Uh, the sending and the catching, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> um, the strobe and the ground. Uh, but one of uh, one of these uh, wires here handles that. But I'm just going to go ahead and replace the entire connector, just so we know that all of the switches are going to be responding properly. Because if the one's acting up, probably everyone on that line is acting up. Obviously, uh, the line's not making good contact. And then also, uh, there's probably other ones that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So we're going to go ahead and replace that connector just as we replace this connector. Now if you need the pins to replace one of these and you need the little housings and stuff, a good place to get that stuff is a website called twistywristarcade.com. Uh, we've, we've bought from that gentleman for years and years and years. He's a good dude. Twistywristarcade.com. And then if you need like the, uh, the uh, crimpers or anything to, to put the, the uh, parts in, you can always check out our website too. Go to lionsarcade.com. We have a parts page on there, and on our parts page, we have uh, some crimpers, for one, listed that we use. And then we have plenty of, uh, I'm just seeing more weird stuff every time I look around. This is such a complex game. We have uh, lots of different tools that we use in our repairs. Those links on our website, lionsarcade.com, the parts page at the top, if, uh, if you click those, usually it'll take you to like Amazon. And if you buy anything on Amazon, like if you go buy a donut on Amazon, after you click our link, it gives us a tip. So we appreciate everybody that's been doing that. Okay, so I'm going to replace that connector, and hopefully that'll get it where uh, everything's playing nice and smooth. Maybe we can give it a little try. Okay, folks, so uh, I'm, we're checking to see if uh, there's anything major that's not working right, and then if, the, uh, if it can recognize when the ball enters the out hole. No sound. I think I need to work on the plunger just a little bit too. We got our drop targets all dropping like they should, and then they all reset like they should. Ooh, came out of the saucer. Okay. So you see it does the drop targets in order. One, two, three. The uh the wire frame, or the wire switches that are hanging over uh, the left and right loops there, I call them loops, are what turn off the zipper flippers. So watch, the zipper flippers will close. Oop, I fell out. Like, like that. <laughs> the zipper flippers will close when you get up in there. When you hit a drop target, it closes it. Okay, so see how they've closed? Now when it hits that switch on the left or the right, it knows that the ball has left basically that area and it, it opens the zipper flippers back up. The main reason it's doing that is so you can make the spinner shot. Well, I keep screwing up that, that shot. There we go, look, you, you save one every once in a while. Both of the kickers are working. I always forget the little save thing. So you can see how the games are kind of clunky whenever there's no... Uh... Well, didn't get it. 
they're, the games, the, they're kind of clunky when there's no sound. So you definitely need the sound. But it looks like it is recognizing every time we lose the ball now. So I think the, I think it was that switch uh, wire. I had kind of figured it out because it would just be stuck where it didn't know where the ball was, and then I would wiggle that uh, top connector, and it would start working. So you know what this game needs? It needs some cool sound. So we're going to do two videos on the sound. We're making this like a whole freaking extreme uh, where we're analyzing the crap out of this super cool game because you don't see it very often, you know? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do one video on Bally's famous Squawk and Talk soundboard, which is the soundboard that's in this. We're going to try to fix the one that's in here that's not making a peep. And then... We have actually had a gentleman that makes a new reproduction, like a, not reproduction, but replacement soundboard for the Squawk and Talk. And uh, we're going to install his new board in this game and test it out and just show the differences and all of that. Nice. I think I guess we're were they all up or was one missing still? You see the one light bulb out that we're still waiting on the part for. All right, so that's the fifth ball. All right, so there you go. So I hope you enjoyed it so far. Like I said, we're going to do two soundboard videos next. So wait for that. All right. <laughs> Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you. And people, don't forget, check out my brother Donnie. My brother has his own channel here on YouTube. I'm over there with him a lot of the time, uh, having a good time. Very lighthearted channel. <laughs> uh, we've done tons of crazy videos over there. So we did, we did a whole series of videos where we restored a mobile home. We've got another series like that that we've got starting soon. We did a uh, series of videos where we rebuilt like an old building that was in downtown of this small little town. It was an old jailhouse building. <laughs> we fixed it up uh, and uh, rented that out. So we've done all kinds of videos like that. So go check it out. He also does vehicle repairs and stuff like that. And uh, I will see you over there. But we'll see you back next time when we get into the legendary, the famous, the incredible, the mesmerizing, the unbelievable Bally Squawk and Talk soundboard. See you then.